Chapter 16 of Baseball Joe of the Silver Stars by Lester Chadwick. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Donald Cummings. Chapter 16 Mr. Matson is Alarmed. Joe Matson did not know what to do. He wanted to rush away from where he was concealed, get home as quickly as possible, and tell his father what he had overheard. While Mr. Matson's name had not been mentioned, knowing, as Joe did, that his parent was engaged on some patents, seeing Mr. Benjamin, manager of the Harvester Works, and having heard the conversation between him and Mr. Holdney, the lad was almost certain that some danger threatened his father. And yet I can't get away from here until they're well out of sight, reasoned Joe. If I go now, they'll see or hear me, and they'll be bound to suspect something. Yet I'd like to warn Dad as soon as I can. There's no telling when they may put up some job against him. But Joe could only crouch down there and wait. At length, he could stand it no longer. He reasoned that the men must be far enough away by this time to make it safe for him to emerge. They're on the road to Riverside, thought Joe, and I may run into them, but if I see them, I can slip into the fields and go around. Mr. Benjamin doesn't know me, for he's hardly ever noticed me when I've been to the harvester works to see Dad. But Mr. Holney might remember me. I can't take any chances. Cautiously, he emerged from the bushes and looked as far down the road as he could. There was no one in sight, and he started off. A little distance farther on, the road made a sharp turn, and, just at the angle, stood an old barn which hid the rest of the highway from sight until one was right at the turn. It was a dangerous place for vehicles, but the owner of the barn had refused to set it back. No sooner had Joe turned this corner than he came full upon Mr. Benjamin and Mr. Holdney standing just around the barn, apparently in deep conversation. At the sight of Joe, they looked up quickly, and Mr. Benjamin exclaimed, Ha! Perhaps this lad can help us. We want to hire a carriage. Do you know anyone around here who would let us take one for a short time? Joe, who had started back at the unexpected sight of the two men, took courage on hearing this and realizing that he had not yet been recognized. I don't know anyone around here, he said. I'm pretty much of a stranger myself, but have you tried at this farmhouse? And he pointed toward the one where the owner of the barn lived. Oh, we don't want a farm horse, exclaimed Mr. Holdney. We want something that has some speed. Then, as he looked more fully at Joe, he exclaimed, Haven't I seen you somewhere before, my lad? I'm sure I have. He took a step toward our hero, and Joe's heart gave a flutter. He was almost certain that Mr. Holdney would recognize him, and then the next step would be to ask where he had been. The men might at once suspect that he had at least come past the place where they had been talking in secret, and they might even suspect that he had listened to them. Joe was in a predicament. "'I'm sure I've met you somewhere before,' went on Mr. Holdney, in his quick, nervous tones. "'Do you live around here?' yes answered joe vaguely but i don't know where you could get a fast horse unless it's in town in riverside he was about to pass on hoping the men would not further bother him when mr holdney coming a step nearer said with great firmness i'm sure i've seen you before what's your name like a flash a way out of it came to joe and that without telling an untruth i play on the silver stars he said quickly you may have seen me at some of the games, which was perfectly possible. That's it, exclaimed Mr. Holdney. I knew it was somewhere. Now, I'm going into Riverside, went on Joe quickly. If you'd like, I'll stop at the livery stable and tell them to send out a rig for you if you want to wait here for it. The very thing, exclaimed Mr. Benjamin. Let him do that, Rufus. There is a quarter to pay for your trouble, my lad. No, thank you, exclaimed Joe with a laugh. I'm glad to do you a favor. All right, assented Mr. Benjamin. If you'll send out a two-seated carriage and a man to drive it, we'll be obliged to you. Then we can drive over and see Duncan, he added to Mr. Holdney. We'll fix this thing all up now. Yes, and if it's my father you're trying to fix, mused Joe, I'll do my best to put a stop to it. Now it's up to me to hurry home. And telling the men that he would do the errand for them, the lad hastened off down the road, leaving the two conspirators in earnest conversation. The livery stable-keeper readily agreed to send out the carriage, and then Joe lost no time in hurrying to his house. 
Has father come home yet? He asked of his mother, for sometimes Mr. Matson came from the harvester works earlier than the regular stopping time. No, answered Mrs. Matson. Why, what's the matter, Joe? Has anything happened? For she noticed by his face that something out of the usual had occurred. Oh, I don't know, he answered slowly. He was revolving in his mind whether or not he ought to tell his mother. Then, as he recollected that his father always consulted her on business matters, he decided that he would relate his experience. Mother, he said, isn't father interested in some sort of a patent about corn? About corn? Oh, I know what you mean. Yes, he is working on an improvement to a corn reaper and binder. It is a machine partly owned by the harvester people, but he expects to make considerable money by perfecting the machine. It is very crude now and doesn't do good work. And if he does perfect it, and someone gets the patents away from him, he won't make the money? exclaimed Joe. Joe, what do you mean? cried his mother in alarm. I am sure something has happened. What is it? It hasn't happened yet, but it may any time, answered the lad. And then he told of what he had overheard, and his ideas of what was pending. That's why I wanted to see father in a hurry, to warn him, he concluded. Joe, I believe you're right, exclaimed Mrs. Matson. Your father ought to be told at once. I don't know what he can do, if anything, to prevent these men from getting ahead of him. Oh, it's too bad. I know he's always suspected, Mr. Benjamin, of not being strictly honest. But Mr. Holdney used to be his friend, and on several occasions has loaned your father money. Oh, this is too bad. But perhaps it isn't too late. If I were you, I'd go down to the harvester works, and you may meet father coming home. Then you can tell him all about it, and he may want to go back and get some of his papers or parts of the machine from his office so those men can't take them. That's the very thing, mother, cried Joe. You ought to have been a man, or a boy and a baseball player. You can think so quickly. That reminds me, I had quite an experience today. Just say applesauce to me when I get back, and I'll tell you all about it. It can't be possible, exclaimed Mr. Matson, when Joe, having met him just outside the harvester works, told him of what he had heard. It hardly seems possible that they would do such a thing, but I'm glad you told me, Joe. Do you think they meant you, Dad? I didn't hear them mention your name. Of course they meant me, declared Mr. Matson. The warning came just in time, too, for only today I finished an important part of the machinery, and the pattern of it is in my office now. I must go back and get it. Wait here for me. As Joe stood at the outer gate of the big harvester plant, he heard the sound of a carriage approaching. And turning around, he saw Mr. Benjamin and Mr. Holney coming along in the rig Joe had had sent out to them only a little while before. I thought it better to drive back here first and go see Duncan later, Mr. Benjamin was saying, and then both men caught sight of our hero. End of chapter 16. Recording by Donald Cummings, Monroe, Connecticut.